I'm sure that each of us has experienced times in our lives where we've been invited to a party or a, or a gathering of sorts and we're a bit anxious or nervous about going. And the reason why we're anxious or nervous about going is because of someone who will be there. Now, there's two reasons why we can be nervous about someone being at a party or a gathering. Uh, one is because that person has hurt us in the past uh, or they have this sort of uh, habit of continually trying to hurt us. And so straight away, when we think about that person, our brain goes, this is a threat. And so that's why we start to feel anxious. So that could be one reason why. But there's another reason too, and it's this. It could be that the person that we're anxious about is someone that we have wronged, someone that we have harmed. And we know that if we see them, they're probably going to be angry towards us. They're probably going to say things to us that uh, we don't like to hear. It's going to be uncomfortable. Now, if there was one person who really, really understood what it was like to be uncomfortable about the prospect of seeing someone that they had wronged, it was a man named Onesimus, who we read about in Philemon and in Colossians. Uh, it seems that Onesimus had become a Christian as a result of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, even while Paul was in jail. And uh, Onesimus joins with this uh, other band of uh, workers with Paul, people like uh, Luke and Mark, the gospel writers. Uh, he is one of those people who's working with Paul while Paul's in prison to try and preach the gospel uh, throughout Rome. And it seems that uh, uh, Onesimus was someone who was very, very useful uh, to Paul. Indeed, the word Onesimus means useful. Now, Paul gives Onesimus a job to do, as well as a man named Tychicus. Uh, he sends them both some 2,000 kilometres from Rome to a place called Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey. And uh, they are sent to Colossae to deliver two letters. Uh, one, the letter to the Colossians, to the Colossian church. The other was to a man named Philemon, who actually had the Colossian church meeting in his house. 2,000 kilometres from Rome to Colossae, and I bet you that with each kilometre, Onesimus was getting more and more anxious. Now, we know that uh, Colossae was Onesimus's hometown, but he had left his hometown in bad circumstances. You see, Onesimus was actually a slave. And Onesimus's master was a man named Philemon. And it seems that what the Apostle Paul is doing with his letter to Philemon is trying to, if you like, bring about reconciliation between Onesimus and Philemon. Indeed, we could say that Philemon is a letter seeking reconciliation between a master and his runaway slave. Uh, look at what verses 8 to 12 have to say. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love, I then, as Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. Onesimus was a runaway slave. He had abandoned his master, Philemon, and under Roman law, he could be deserving of death for doing so. And so here is Onesimus. He's turned up in Rome, some 2,000 kilometres away. He's come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's working with Paul. And as Paul becomes aware of Onesimus's background, he is left with the conclusion that he must send Onesimus back. But he doesn't just want to send Onesimus back. He wants a situation where Onesimus and Philemon are reconciled, where they are reconciled. Indeed, have a look at verses 15 to 17. He says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, 
no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Paul wants to see this runaway slave who is deserving of punishment to be reconciled with the master that he had wronged, but not just reconciled so it's just a master-slave relationship all over again, but reconciled as brothers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's looking at reconciliation at a much, much deeper level. And it seems that this letter had the desired effect. Uh, tradition tells us that uh, Onesimus would eventually become the Bishop of Ephesus. And uh, no doubt, this letter was very, very key in enabling all of that to happen down the track. Paul writes to bring about this reconciliation between master and slave. Now, at this point, maybe some of you are a little bit concerned. Does the Bible endorse slavery, you might be thinking? Because, after all, Paul doesn't explicitly tell Philemon to stop having slaves, does he? Uh, he tells Philemon to welcome Onesimus back as a brother in the Lord, but he doesn't say that means you're no longer a slave. Also, in our first reading for this morning from Colossians, we saw that Paul talked to slaves and masters in that letter. But nowhere did he say, slaves, you should no longer be slaves, you should be free. Masters, you should free your slaves. He didn't say that. He told slaves to obey uh, their masters and he told masters to provide what was right and fair to their slaves. And so again, you could be thinking, does the Bible endorse the concept of slavery? Well, Friends, uh, let me sort of answer that question. You could write a whole book on this particular issue, but let me just make a few comments uh, briefly. Uh, the first thing is that in 1 Timothy 1 verse 10, so that's 1 Timothy 1 verse 10, the Apostle Paul lists slave trading as something that goes against God's law. Now, the idea of slave trading is kidnapping someone uh, in order to make them a slave. And so as you look back through history, uh, we've seen that a number of African people were kidnapped, taken to England, taken to America in order to become slaves. Now the Bible is very clear that slave trading of that order is not on, okay? It's unlawful, it goes against God's law. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 21, also uh, spells out, Paul says to slaves, if you are able to gain your freedom, then seek to do so. Okay, so it's good to be free, says Paul, if you can gain it. So slave trading is out and it's good if you can gain freedom from slavery. But why does Paul give these instructions to slaves and to masters, which just seems to uphold this institution at that time? Well, friends, uh, the final thing I just want to say on this matter is that slavery uh, in the Roman Empire times in the first century was quite different to the type of slavery that we associate uh, with England and America much later on. About a third of the uh, population in the Roman Empire at that time were slaves. Uh, another third, it seems, were former slaves. Indeed, uh, it seems that some slaves had better lifestyles than some free people because they happen to be slaves to a particularly affluent master. Now, yes, some of the people who were slaves in the Roman Empire were slaves because they were kidnapped. And again, Paul in 1 Timothy 1 verse 10 is saying, that's not on. But some became slaves because there was no such thing as Centrelink. There was no such thing as job keeper or job seeker. Uh, there were no welfare agencies that you could turn to if you found yourself in poverty. And so what would happen if you were in poverty, uh, you were struggling to survive, you would sell yourself to someone and they would have you as a part of their household and you would be provided for by them and you would work for them. Yes, you'd be their property, but you would work for them and you would be provided for. The other thing I just want you to bear in mind is that when people like William Wilberforce uh, campaigned against slavery uh, in the 17th, 18th century, whenever it was, 
the Christian church was a very big institution at that point, okay? At this time, the Christian church is very tiny, relatively speaking. The whole economy of Rome really is built on the notion of slavery. Again, remember, a third of the people are slaves, so it was very, very hard for the Christians at that time to affect the kind of systematic change that people like William Wilberforce would affect some hundreds of years later. But in the meantime, Paul says, given this is the situation we've got, thinking Christianly about this, slaves, obey your masters, masters, look after your slaves, do what is right and fair for them. So it's not the ideal situation, but these instructions are given uh, this is the situation they're in, this is the best way to deal with it, Christianly. So I don't think that the Bible endorses slavery. Indeed, people like William Wilberforce were Christians who argued against the abolition of slavery, particularly slave trading. But here is the Apostle Paul trying to reconcile a master and his runaway slave, a runaway slave who deserved great punishment. But friends, the book of Philemon is more than just a letter seeking reconciliation between a master and a runaway slave. When you dig into this book in more detail, there are some marvellous themes that start to emerge. And so this brings us to our next point, which is that Philemon is a letter which illustrates the truth of the gospel. Uh, Philemon is probably, I think, the only letter of Paul where he doesn't explicitly talk about how Jesus saves us. Uh, through his death in our place. But even though he doesn't talk explicitly about it, what is described here in Philemon is a real-life illustration of the gospel message. How so? Well, there's a couple of things I want to point out from this book which uh, show that. First of all, we are all like Onesimus. What was Onesimus? He was a runaway slave turned his back on his master, refused to live under his rule, ran away from him, was not going to please him or obey him anymore. Now, friends, that is an illustration of sin. You see, God is the master of humanity. He made us. And because God made us, we all have an obligation to live under his rule. We have an obligation to please him to obey him, to honour him in all that we do. But when we sin, we're like Onesimus. We run away from living under the rule of God. We say to God, I don't want to live under your rule anymore. I don't want to have to please you, obey you or honour you. No, I want to run life for myself. And just as Onesimus under Roman law deserved punishment for running away from his master, even death, so too we, because we have disobeyed our maker in that way, are deserving of punishment from him. We die because of our rebellion against God, and the Bible is very clear, we deserve God's anger to be poured out upon us for our failure to live his way. We are all like Onesimus. But friends, just as the Apostle Paul in this letter to Philemon seeks to bring about reconciliation between a master and a slave, so God acted to bring about reconciliation between sinners and himself. And he did it ultimately through the work of Jesus. And this is the second thing I want to say about this, uh, how Philemon illustrates the truth of the gospel. What we see is that Paul in this letter acts like Jesus as an intercessor and a price payer. Have a look at uh, verses 17 to 19 eight. It says, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. So the Apostle Paul is acting as an intercessor in this letter or a go-between. And another word that we can use to describe an intercessor or a go-between is the word priest. Uh, a priest, if you like, is a go-between between humanity and God when we look at how it's used uh, in the Old Testament context. And what the scriptures tell us is that Jesus is our great high priest. Uh, he is the one who speaks to God 
on our behalf so we can be reconciled with God. Those that have their faith in Jesus have Jesus speaking for them. Uh, Indeed, when we pray, Jesus acts as that intercessor. You know how we finish our prayers? We pray this in the name of Jesus. We're actually acknowledging that Jesus is our intercessor who is bringing these prayers to the Father on our behalf. So Paul, by writing this letter, is acting as an intercessor. He's being like Jesus in that sense. But more than that, Paul is willing to be a price payer. So Onesimus, because he had run away from his master, had incurred a debt to his master. You see, because he was obligated to provide services to his master, but a failure to do so meant that he had incurred a debt. He deserved to be punished for what he had done. But notice what the Apostle Paul is wanting to do here. He says, well, look, if he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I'm willing to pay, says the Apostle Paul. I'm willing to pay the price that is necessary to overcome the debt, to overcome the punishment, so that you and Onesimus can be reconciled. The Apostle Paul is being Jesus-like in the way in which he's seeking to bring about reconciliation here, by being the go-between, the priest, if you like, and the one willing to sacrifice to make the payment necessary to bring about that reconciliation. Friends, it is only through the Lord Jesus Christ and the price that he paid as he died on the cross, taking the hell we deserved, and his intercession with the Father, it's only through that and by trusting in him that we can be reconciled with God. And here in Philemon, not only do we have a letter that is uh, seeking to bring about reconciliation between a master and his runaway slave, this letter is an illustration of the greater truth of the reconciliation with God that can be ours through the Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the great themes that emerges from this book is the theme of reconciliation. But the other big theme that emerges from this book is the theme of fellowship, fellowship. And this brings us to our next point, which is that Philemon is a letter that teaches us about Christian fellowship. Now, What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the word fellowship? My guess is you're thinking morning tea, right? Because quite often people will sort of say, okay, it's time for fellowship, which we go, morning tea. And in that case, we're not having fellowship anymore, right? Because we can't have morning tea at the moment. But friends, Christian fellowship is something much more deeper and much more profound than people sharing together in morning tea. The word fellowship at its heart is all, it's all about sharing, partnering. So in a sense, when we have morning tea together, we are sharing in a common lot of food, okay? But that's not Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship is sharing in a totally different order. What I wanna to suggest to you as we look at Philemon is that Christian fellowship is sharing a common faith, which results in love for one another. So what is it that brings us together uh, here in this building that brings people to come watch us online? Well, it's that we have faith in Jesus, that we have experienced reconciliation with God through our trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what unites us. We have this common bond. We share in this common faith. Okay, so Christian fellowship is built on the foundation of this common belief that we all share. But friends, this uh, common belief that we share is not just some kind of intellectual exercise. Uh, As we saw, as we looked at uh, the book of Galatians, when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you receive the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God starts to change you and to transform you and to bear his fruit in your life. And one of the qualities that emerges is love. We're brought together, we share in common our faith in Jesus, and from that emerges love. And true Christian fellowship is expressed as we share that love with one another in different ways, okay? Now, it seems that Philemon 
was very, very good at Christian fellowship. Indeed, have a look at what verses 4 to 7 have to say. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Now, uh, first thing I want to point out is that word saint. Uh, remember our Archbishop a couple of weeks ago said uh, that there are two groups of people in the world. There are saints or sinners, and you don't become a saint by performing a couple of miracles and having the church sort of deem you to be holier than thou, right? No, you are a saint. That is, you are one who is set apart to be God's people if you trust in Jesus, okay? And it seems that Philemon was very good at loving the saints, now, again, his love is grounded in his faith in the Lord Jesus. He has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what results from that faith is love for others, love for the saints, love which actually refreshes the hearts of the saints. Indeed, one of the ways in which he showed that love, as I talked about earlier, is that he opened up his home for the Colossian church to meet in. So this is a man who trusts in Jesus, and because he trusts in Jesus, love overflows for others. He shares with others. Now, I just want you to notice what Paul prays for Philemon in verse 6. He says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Now, let's just look at this little phrase, sharing your faith, first of all. What comes to your mind when you hear that phrase, sharing your faith? My guess is that most of you are thinking about evangelism, sharing with people about who Jesus is and what he has done and how we can be reconciled with God through him. But I want to suggest to you that I don't think that that's what this phrase is actually referring to here in Philemon. Uh, the word which is translated as sharing here is the word fellowship. Uh, koinonia, fellowship. And so what he is praying is that uh, something will happen to Philemon as he fellowships in line with his faith. Okay, so remember, we have faith in Jesus. What's to result from our faith in Jesus? It is love. Okay, love, sharing with others in love. And that's what's being talked about there. So generosity is one of the things that's probably a bit being talked about here, okay? So this idea of sharing your faith with what Philemon says is all about loving others and sharing with others in line with our faith. That's the idea. Now, he prays that Philemon may be active in sharing his faith. Well, Paul's already telling us that Philemon is being active, okay? Uh, that word that we translate as active uh, is the Greek word energes, from which we get energy, okay? Now, that word could also be translated as powerful or effective. So it's not like Philemon's not engaging in the sharing of his faith, because he is. These verses tell us he is. But what Paul is praying is that his efforts in doing so might be effective, that they might be powerful, that they might make a big difference, so that in doing so, he can actually have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. And I gather that what's being talked about there is the idea that as we see Christ at work in our lives by his spirit, as we show love to others and make a difference in the lives to others, we see how God is at work in us, the good things that he is doing in us. And as we see the Christian community functioning in that way, and we're all fellowshipping together in that sense, sharing with one another, loving with one another, we see how the Spirit of Christ is transforming a community. So I think Paul's praying that Philemon's efforts at fellowshipping would be powerful and effective so that the impact of Christ can be seen very, very clearly and understood. That's the idea. Let me ask, do you pray for people like that? That they might be effective fellowshippers 
so that they can grow in their fullness of their understanding of the good things that Christ has provided for them. Friends, I think it's really, really good that we read Paul's letters because we often see the way in which he prays for people and it challenges us to change the way in which we pray. And so this is a good thing to pray. Pray that your brothers and sisters in Christ would be effective and powerful in their fellowshipping in line with the faith so that their understanding of the good things they have in Christ will grow day by day. So friends, true Christian fellowship can occur over morning tea, right? But it's this idea that we share a common bond of faith which results in love. And in that love, we then share with one another. Now, this uh, particular letter to Philemon does talk about uh, fellowship on a couple of specific occasions. So you've got that verse 6 there, which talks about fellowship or sharing. And verse 17 talks about... Uh, partnership kind of idea. So this fellowship sort of concept is very much a part of Philemon. And what we see as we work our way through the letter are the marks of love that show that Christian fellowship uh, is occurring within a community. So let me uh, spell out five of the marks that the book of Philemon speaks about. So what we see is that the love of Christian fellowship is expressed by doing the right thing by other believers. So in verses 12 to 14, we read, I'm sending Onesimus, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. I just want you you to put yourself in Paul's footsteps for a moment. So we're told in this letter he is a prisoner for Christ Jesus. It's because of his commitment to the gospel that he has found himself in jail in Rome. Okay? And so it's pretty hard to do good gospel ministry while you're stuck in jail. All right? And so Paul's got this little group of helpers, including Luke and Mark and Demas and others, and he's really kind of relying on them to help him in this ministry, and Onesimus is one of them. But then Paul discovers Onesimus' background, that he was actually a runaway slave who belonged to Philemon, a guy that Paul had actually led to faith, as we'll hear about later on. And Paul's now thinking, he's a runaway slave. I've got to send him back to his master, but he's actually my very heart. He's actually so, so useful here. Philemon's 2,000 kilometres away. Maybe he won't notice. There's no internet, remember? No phones. It's a long way. It takes a long way to travel. Maybe I should try and keep Onesimus here because it's good for the gospel. But friends, it wasn't going to be good for Christian fellowship. It would cause a rupture within the fellowship if Paul had done that. And so Paul does the right thing even though it would be to his cost, even though he was going to be losing one who was his very heart, he knows it's the right thing, it's the loving thing to send Onesimus back to Philemon. And friends, if we are really engaged in Christian fellowship, we will always be seeking to do the right thing by others, even if it costs us. Second mark. The love of Christian fellowship is expressed by treating other believers as family. Uh, Verses 15 to 16, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. You know what I love about the gospel? We're all the same. We're all the same. Uh, Before God, doesn't matter whether we are super rich or in a high sort of uh, position of office or whether we are the lowest of low according to society, before God, we're all the same. And when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're all the same. Whether you're Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free is irrelevant. Our standing before God is the same. We are children of the Heavenly Father. And we now become brothers and sisters in the faith. And notice that uh, Paul's request 
uh, to Philemon is to accept Onesimus as a brother. So, humanly speaking, or from a worldly perspective, Philemon's the master. Onesimus is the runaway slave. But no, says Paul, in light of the gospel, everything changes. Even though from a worldly perspective, I might be the master and someone might be the slave, I need to treat my slave like a brother or a sister in the Lord. I need to treat them as family. Now, I know sometimes in family life, people don't get on and things don't work out so well. But the idea of treating people like family is that we treat them well. We treat them really well. And that is what Christian fellowship does. Christian fellowship says, I don't care what your ranking is in the world. You're my brother. You are my sister. And I'll treat you as such. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about church life. We are family. Maybe not by blood friends, but we are family because we're one in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter the rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, we're one. We're the same. We're family. And we need to treat one another in that way. But as I said, sometimes within families, things don't work out so well. So this brings us to the next aspect of Christian fellowship, and which is that the love of Christian fellowship is expressed by welcoming the repentant sinner. So uh, verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me. So that word partner is that koinonon, it's that koinonia language again, fellowship language. So basically Paul is saying, if we're in fellowship, then I want you to welcome Onesimus back. Welcome him back. Now, I don't think that Onesimus was a begrudging sort of messenger or went begrudgingly back to Colossae. I think he understood that he needed to go back, that he'd done wrong. Uh, so I don't think Paul had to force him to go back. I think he goes back as a repentant sinner. And the idea here is we are to welcome repentant sinners. There are times in the life of uh, uh, the church of Jesus where people uh, offend one another, hurt one another, do wrong to others, okay? And it can be very easy at that time for grudges to form, for there to be divisions. But if the person who has wronged you comes back and acknowledges that they have wronged you and seeks forgiveness, then in line with how God has treated us, we are to welcome and forgive those people who have wronged us. Now, there might be cases where people have wronged us and there's division, but they're not repentant. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 18 what to do there. We are to talk one-to-one -one with the person and try and resolve the issue. And if that doesn't work, we take a couple of others with us. And if that doesn't work, we you know, bring it before the whole church. And if that doesn't work, we kick them out and with the hope that they'll come back. But if someone has wronged you and they are repentant, they are genuinely sorry, we must welcome them as Christ brought about welcome for us from God. We must do so. Friends, if there are grudges and divisions, then Christian fellowship is not really happening as it ought. Christian fellowship is built upon the grace of God and it must reflect the grace of God. Next, we see that the love of Christian fellowship is expressed by showing honour to those who have helped us spiritually. Have a look at uh, verses 19 to 21. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Now, the truth of the matter is, as I've already said, we're all on the same level, okay, when it comes to Christian fellowship. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. But there are some brothers and sisters in Christ that we should be honouring particularly. Those, and the ones we should be honouring particularly are those who have helped us spiritually, and in particular, those who have helped us to be saved. Uh, it seems that Philemon had been saved through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, it was probably in Ephesus where that took place. And notice that the Apostle Paul says, you owe me your very self. 
Uh, just think about this. Imagine you're drowning at sea and someone comes in a boat and rescues you. How do you feel about that person who's rescued you? I'm guessing you feel very, very positive about them, don't you? Uh, I'm guessing that you probably want to do something nice for them, that you want to show your appreciation for the fact that they rescued you and saved your life. Well, friends, being rescued from the pits of hell is something much, much greater. Much, much greater. Now, my guess is that uh, most of us, when it comes to sharing the gospel of Jesus with others, find that a fearful thing to do. It makes us quite anxious, okay? But there are people who overcame that nervousness and anxiety and spoke the gospel to us. And uh, by the grace of God, they were used to help open our eyes to the truth and to rescue us from hell. And I take it as we look at this example here in Philemon that we are to seek to find ways to honour those people to show our respect for those people, to show our appreciation for their ministry towards us. Now, notice that uh, what the Apostle Paul asks for here is not something that will ultimately benefit himself. Uh, he asks for Philemon to show that honour by being reconciled uh, with Onesimus. That's what he asks. But it is good for us to think about those who have helped us spiritually, who have led us to faith, how do we show honour and respect to them? Now, in the illustration I'm about to tell, I'm not asking you to do this for me, but I'm just providing an illustration of what someone does for me. So there's uh, one particular person that I led to Christ, and every Christmas I get a nice gift from them. That's their way of seeking to honour me. Okay, again, I'm not asking those of you that I've led to Christ or whatever to do that for me. I'm not asking for that. But I'm just saying that's an example of how someone has sought to put that honouring of the person that's helped them spiritually into practice. So Christian fellowship involves that. And finally, we see that the love of Christian fellowship is expressed by showing hospitality to other believers. So in verses 1 to 2, uh, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, probably Philemon's wife, uh, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, probably Philemon's son, uh, and to the church that meets in your home. Uh, Philemon shares his home with people. He opens it up for the church to meet. This is an example of hospitality, okay? He loves these people. He shares his very home with these people so that they can meet, so they can be refreshed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, uh, when we tend to think about hospitality today, uh, we tend to think of it as inviting people over for a meal. And I want to say that it's probably no less than that, but it's certainly a lot more than that. Okay? It's certainly a lot more than that. Indeed, listen to what uh, the Apostle Paul says in verse 22. He says, And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Well, certainly one way Philemon could honour Paul for all that he had done for him was to not just have him over for dinner, but to have him stay at his house, to open up his house to him. Uh, I've uh, just come back from holidays and I was up in Foster. And uh, while I was up in Foster, uh, I caught up with uh, a man named James who I helped to lead to faith when I was... Uh, back in Beverly Hills, back in the year 2000. And uh, it's of great encouragement to me to see that James is now in ministry full-time. He's working in the Anglican church up there, uh, you know, doing great things. And so I caught up with James. James opened up his house, you know, invited me to come in, and, and we spent, you know, about three hours together catching up, and it was great. And at the end of the time, James said, oh, I want you to have a look at something in my house. I said, sure. So he sort of walks me over and takes me to this part of the house where there's a room with a bed in it. He says, Mark, this is our designated guest room. Now, James and his wife, Sophie, they've got five kids. You know, I'm sure one of the kids would love to have their own room and use that guest room, right? But they say, no, we've set aside this room because we want to have people come and stay with us. If there are people in need, we want them to come in. If people are traveling, we want to sort of accommodate them. That's an example of them seeking to show hospitality. 
They have faith in Jesus, they love Jesus, they want to share with others out of that love for Jesus, and so that's the way in which they're sharing their house. So hospitality is something that is part and parcel of Christian fellowship. So friends, Philemon is probably a letter that many of us haven't spent a lot of time on, is my guess. Uh, We probably haven't sort of poured through it. But I hope you can see it's a wonderful letter with two beautiful themes of reconciliation and fellowship. Reconciliation between a master and a slave, which illustrates the reconciliation that we have with God through Jesus and how emanating out of that reconciliation and that faith is the love of Christian fellowship. The love of Christian fellowship, which means we do the right thing by others, that we treat one another as family, that we welcome the repentant sinner, that we honour those who have helped us spiritually and that we show hospitality. Let me now pray giving thanks for that reconciliation that is ours in Christ and let me now pray that we might indeed be really, really good fellowshippers, not in the morning tea sense, but in the Christian sense. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that... uh, even though we were like Onesimus, uh, had run away from your rule and deserved punishment, that you sent the Lord Jesus who intercedes for us and paid the penalty we deserve to pay. And thank you, Father God, for bringing many people uh, to faith in Jesus, many people to be reconciled with you. And thank you that as your spirit works in our lives, that he produces love within us. And so, Father, we pray, help us to be people who are not only active but effective in sharing our faith, in fellowshipping in line with our faith and showing love to others. May we be people who are always doing the right thing by others, even if it costs us. Father God, may we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ as family. And Father, may we not be people who hold grudges but who welcome the repentant sinner. Help us, Lord, to honour those who have helped us spiritually, who have helped us to come into your kingdom and help us, Lord God, to be quick to open our homes, to open our lives and to show hospitality for others. Father, we pray that you would help us to be effective in loving in these ways so that we can grow in a full understanding of all the good things that you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we now pray. Amen.